My guest today is Jordan Thayer. Jordan, how are you? I'm doing all right. How are you, David? I'm doing really well. It's a beautiful, foggy morning here in Chicago, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you're in Indiana, right? Yeah, I'm just north of Indian Carmel, and uh, it's a little overcast here, too. Carmel uh, is the most livable city in the country, isn't it? I believe that we uh, we hold that uh, that honor. We also have the most roundabouts, I think, in total and <laughs> certainly per capita. Um, I did not know that part. Yeah. <laughs> uh, pretty cool. I think there was some sort of round robin elimination, double elimination tournament that made you the most livable city, but I'm not sure. Hmm. <laughs> Uh, what do you do in Carmel? Uh, so I am an AI practice lead for a software product consultancy. Um, that's that's a lot of words, right? In practice, what that means is that if a client has a business need that can be addressed with AI, I help them identify sort of the kinds of AI techniques that could help them, what it would cost to field those, what it would look like to build those in an agile method, and so on. Uh, I also help train our internal engineering staff on those techniques, so identify uh, course material, I produce lectures and things of that nature, uh, all the way down to I'm an individual contributor when we win that work. I will also execute on those projects. Okay. It's, I think it's fair to say that you're the go-to AI person, uh, both in your company and then also at conferences. I hear you speaking about AI. That's a lot of what I do, right? Um, so yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, what's going on with AI these days? I, we're, hearing, we're hearing a lot more about it the last oh, 12 or 18 months than we have previously. Yeah, um, so there was a, a big uh, sort of stuttering step forward. If you if you watch a field, an academic field for long enough, right, there's this sort of steady state of incremental building, and then eventually some big breakthrough happens, and all of a sudden things move forward as if 10 years happened overnight. Right. Um, so that's sort of what we're experiencing in the generative technique space in large language models. Um, they've sort of gotten, well, not sort of, they've gotten way more powerful than they were a year or two years ago, uh, sort of seemingly overnight. Part of that is that we've brought a lot more unique and, in fact, special purpose hardware to bear. Part of that is that there have been some advances in the underlying deep learning techniques that help us do uh, compression and keep large, large models in memory longer. Um, as a result, we're seeing things like instead of just, you know, chatbots and um, the like were, were very much in vogue a few years ago, but now we're seeing them being used for things that we think of as requiring more state or more structure. So you see coding assistance being very, very popular. Mm -hmm. um, and language isn't necessarily restricted to text, so we're able to do image production, time series data production, video production with them, uh, anything that's sort of structured data uh, over time or in a set. And that's been, um, there's been a, like a bunch of companies are rising up around those technologies and whatnot. So the ecosystem's kind of going crazy. Yeah, I think the one that's getting the most attention is OpenAI, mostly because of ChatGPT and maybe DALI to, to a lesser mm -hmm. extent. But that's getting attention not only in the, 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 the IT space, but in the popular press as well. It's, yeah, it's absolutely. Really, uh, it, seems like, uh, it seems like generative AI solutions like ChatGPT are the main focus of AI these days. Is that a fair statement? I think that's that's pretty fair. Um, when I talk to people about AI, that's that's usually the thing that's at top of mind for them, right? Like, how can I write better ad copy or approve my articles internally faster? Things like that mm -hmm. are what people are asking. Um, but in practice, many of the projects that I've executed on on the last couple of years have been in other spaces, things like vision and planning and scheduling systems, in part because those techniques are a little more um, robust is maybe the wrong word, but they've been fielded for longer. So it's They're sort of more, more understood. Yeah, exactly. It's understood how you would walk from conception to fielding the, the final product. And frankly, people tend to have their data more in a row over there where it's like, well, I understand very well how this large piece of equipment works. In fact, it's got tons of telemetry on it, whereas they maybe don't have their internal knowledge bases instrumented in such a way to be fed into uh, a large language model or used in a RAG system or something like that. Okay. And we were talking off camera that you were, uh, I don't know if frustrated is the right word, but you, I'll, I'll use it anyway. You were kind of frustrated the fact that people are ignoring these other aspects of AI. They're focusing only on what's the new hotness right now, which is this generative stuff. 
Yeah, I think it's easy to sort of have shiny object syndrome or like, you know, chase after the ball like a peewee soccer league. Um, a couple good there, metaphors there. <laughs> right? There's there's all this other cool stuff that's out there that you can reach for. And yeah, the language stuff is really, really cool because it's a very human means of interacting with the system. And that's incredibly attractive. Um, but the other stuff is just as powerful and often is not. I see people... Um, they're focusing on the new technology to sort of the detriment of outcomes or the bottom line where like there's another technology that's not as exciting right now, but would have a larger impact in terms of business outcomes. Uh, talk about that. What are your customers? What, what are the things that are in the AI space that are important to them? So it, it definitely depends on the person. Um, in the manufacturing space, it tends to be margin, waste, and loss. Uh, so we've done a couple of uh, systems for effectively um, die cutting is is the idiom. So like say you have a piece of wood that you're trying to extract a two by four out of. Well, where should I take my two by four out of the piece of living lumber so that I minimize waste and maximize uh, the yield per bore foot? That's an old like problem. That. Right. But it's um, an extremely important one, especially with the cost of lumber. And so every you know little bit that you can extract out of that piece of raw material is extremely important. And it's it's not just the lumber industry. Um, we were recently talking with a company that's interested in maximizing the affected lifespan of the trucking industry. So how much useful life is left in a tractor trailer? And that's uh, not going to be solved with a large language model. Right. It might take techniques from that space, uh, especially deep learning and things of that nature. But fundamentally, it's uh, state estimation under the hood. How much life is left in this light emitting diode that's running on the side of the truck and telling me when I, you know, letting other vehicles know where I am in space hmm. um, and things of that nature. So when folks are, um, I, so I, I would say that's, that's the two major things is um, avoiding un predicted unscheduled downtime and making the most use of raw material, whether that be physical product or time or labor. All right. uh, now, are you, uh, are people coming to you with these questions? Or are they coming to you with, I read this article on the plane over here about how cool generative AI is. We and, see both. Uh, uh, Sorry, I, I didn't mean uh, to well, No, no. How, how, do you, how do you respond to that? That's, uh, I, I, I think uh, it was Joel Polsky who referred to this management by in-flight magazine. Oh, yeah. That's an interesting thought. Um, so we see both. Uh, sometimes people are just, I have a need and yeah. it, it is of this shape. And those are much easier engagements because they're they're in a better headspace, frankly. Yeah, they're open to, to ideas. They exactly. know what they know and they know what they don't know. Right. And then there are um, just as many folks who say either, um, you know, I've heard about these generative techniques and I'm interested in exploring what they can do for my business, which isn't a bad place to be. Yeah, that's a fair safe question. Um, and we also see folks who are like, look for funding reasons or for competitive advantage reasons. I need to be able to say AI in the box. What is the lightest lift that's going to get <laughs> me there? And that's, you know, it's not crass, right? Like it's, it's useful from a business perspective. Yeah. And so those are sort of the three camps that we see, see folks in. Um, and the people that are excited about generative techniques, I think the, I think their spirit's in the right place. I really do. But the thing that I think they're often surprised to find out is given the apparent maturity of the market, how much uncertainty there is in fielding these things. Um, so for example, we were talking with a, uh, company that produces pharmaceuticals, um, and they wanted to provide a sort of a chat bot and interactive recommender system for products in the space that they, they serve. And I was like, that feels really dangerous because there are a lot of regulatory concerns. And is this going to be accepted as medical device? And are you going to be liable for the outcome of that? Um, and that wasn't what they wanted to hear, frankly. They wanted to know that they could feel the device like that. Um, you know, sort of contrapositively, we were talking to a financial services group and they wanted to do a very similar thing and we had similar reservations right this is a regulated industry people are going to act on this advice are you going to be culpable but when we were able in their particular case we were able to say look if you give this as um sort of grist for the mill for your expert advisors like maybe they won't have to write as much copy maybe they can serve a larger pool of people by filtering this advice that's coming out of the system as experts and acting as a final check and safeguard um, those are the kinds of engagements that I've seen that have been more 
more productive and workable, especially in regulated spaces. Uh, makes sense. And bonus points for use of the word contrapositive. Did I use it right? <laughs> you did. Absolutely. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, the, uh, it would, tell me about uh, just the landscape of AI in general. Like people are, um, people are interested in this field, but it's a broad mm -hmm. field. What are the areas that we should be focusing on as a software developer? What, what, where should I be investing my time? So, um, well, so I cut my teeth on heuristic search and optimization algorithms. So those oh, are find the, that. Yeah. So those are the kinds of algorithms that help you uh, find a a good solution to a domain with a lot of possible solutions. So there, there are really simple toy examples like solving a Rubik's cube or sliding tiles puzzle, uh, navigating a character around in a video game. Those were the sort of problems that really interested me when I was starting out. But they're also really useful for things like where should FedEx build its next depot so that they minimize transit times for all of their trucks? How do I schedule air-to-air -air refueling sorties for the U.S. Air Force? Um, and things of that nature. So big scale industrial problems, even down to things like shift scheduling or hospital uh, uh, scheduling for nurse rosters and things like that. I hear a lot um, about optimization and the yeah. examples you're mentioning. Yeah, and so that that's it. Um, you may have also heard of it referred to as something like operations research before. They're all okay. roughly in the same neighborhood. They use different types of techniques to solve the problem, hmm. but um, from a formal perspective, they're solving equivalent problems. Uh, so that's a big area, and it's got a wide body of literature that could help you dig in. Um, you know, even though we've sort of moved on to deep neural networks and deep recurrence and things of this nature, like when people talk about machine learning, they're talking about PyTorch and uh, techniques like those provided by PyTorch. Um, the old techniques are still really useful. Decision trees and clustering and k-nearest neighbors, which are a little more uh, understandable and frankly easier to dig into, still have really useful commercial applications, especially if you're trying to classify things. So um, machine learning is another big place folks can dig into. Um, the large language models are sort of the new thing in natural language processing, but the old style of natural language processing where you do like sentence diagramming and word sense disambiguation and, uh, and even uh, semantic analysis and, uh, oh, uh, valence, but what's the word I'm looking for? Um, where you decide whether or not someone's happy or sad from a piece of oh, text or angry. Sentiment analysis. Sentiment, there we are. Um, so those are all extremely useful and easier to dig into than the large language model stuff, just because they don't require as much scaffolding in terms of hardware. They don't require as much understanding in terms of heavy math if you really, really want to dig in. Um, and then vision is another place where I think, um, you know, I see people very successfully starting to play with systems like OpenCV and doing simple recognition stuff on top of their phone. Uh, I had a buddy who lost a cat a few years ago and he built uh, an OpenCV system to recognize the difference between cats and possums so that he uh, would know what was digging in the food he had left outside and only check when it was maybe his cat. Uh, interesting. Good practical application of technology. Right. <laughs> um, I, I'm looking at your LinkedIn profile right now. I see mm -hmm. you went to Rose Holman, a strong engineering school, and then you have a PhD in computer science yep. from New Hampshire. Um, there's a lot of people watching this show that don't, they would love to get a PhD, but they don't have the time to do it, but they still want to learn what you're talking about. So um, this is, um, where will people go to learn more about all these topics you're talking about? So I think there are some uh, fairly good creators on YouTube for various uh, areas. So 3Red1Blue is a great resource for machine learning. Um, you know, book-wise, I really like AI, A Modern Approach by Russell and Norvig. That's the, the classic textbook that AI is taught, of, um, taught out of in collegiate settings. Hmm. Um, if you're looking for maybe the historical perspective, in my area, Uta Pearl wrote a book called Heuristics uh, back in the 70s, which is very, very informative. I'm at, like the formal uh, methods that go on there. Um, for vision and natural language processing, I don't have those references offhand, but if you ping me after the show, I'll get you some some textbook references oh, that I like well, from I'll that space. The show Thank you. Um, from a from a less like formal perspective and more sort of impact of AI and things like that, I really like Machines Behaving Badly um, by Toby Walsh. I think that's a good book. He's I like a, the title. He's got a, uh, so it's about like, 
what is the impact of AI in asymmetric war? How is it going to impact markets and healthcare? Uh, Toby's a, a researcher from the planning field, so from the area I'm from, a uh, researcher out of ANU where he was at the time that I knew him. I don't know where he's at these days. Uh, and so it's been interesting to see him sort of transition from scientist to public policy personality. Not that he doesn't still do research, but his big thing these days is policy advice. Oh. Um, and he has a new book coming out, which is about um, sort of, I, loosely I would characterize it as the dangers of anthropomorphization in semi-intelligent systems. So like, remember that it's a machine back there and it doesn't have feelings and thoughts and you'll be okay. Lots of movies made about that. <laughs> right. I just looked up on Amazon. He is at the University of South of New South Wales. Okay. Uh, uh, is there anything we haven't covered that you feel is vital to this topic? Um, so there are, um, I think the biggest thing, uh, the biggest bugaboo in AI that we haven't really talked about is people are of the impression that AI systems are very clever and they do super impressive things. I don't mean to diminish that, um, but the way in which they achieve that is comically stupid. So um, <laughs> like you think about solving a Rubik's cube, that can be hard until you've learned how to do it. Solving a Rubik's cube in the fewest number of moves is incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. The way an AI achieves that is to effectively explore the space of all sequences of moves as quickly as it can, and then just run into the solution fast by dint of going quickly and making foolish decisions thousands or hundreds of thousands of times a second. Yeah, like I do. And most of the approaches that we use are not similar from that, right? It's, well, computers are really good at linear algebra, so I'll encode this problem as some sort of minimization thing in a big system of simultaneously solved equations and then go to town. It's not really thinking as you and I think about thinking, right? right? It's, it's just doing math. Um, and I think that gets lost in sort of the, the glamor of what these things do. Yeah, I think uh, well, uh, probably Hollywood is part of the name for that, that uh, betrayal sure. of artificial intelligence, partly the popular press is, you know, I think what's one thing that's lost among a lot of users is that much of AI is about probabilities. It's not mm -hmm. about exact answers and understanding that, that it's getting you close to the exact answer, but it's not giving you a, with 100% certainty like a lot of computer science does. Yeah. If you yeah. a mathematical equation, there's there's inputs and there's one correct output and the rest right. are all wrong. That's yeah, not you, true. And it, it's easy to forget that when it's uh, something as being as helpful as uh, GitHub Copilot, for example, generating for example, code for me, yeah. which is really good, but I'm still, I still have to review it. It's still not perfect. We've got a really big looming problem in that space too, right? There's this sort of well-known thing where if people um, don't have to scrutinize the output of a system, they'll stop scrutinizing the output of the system. Sure. And you don't want that kind of decision fatigue to creep in on folks that are, you know, making medical decisions or driving a bus or whatever the case may be. Um, so we have, even though we have these powerful algorithms now, I think we have a lot of ways to go in the UX space and the human computer interaction space to understand sort of how we're going to responsibly use these and have benefit overall rather than these sort of detrimental uh, degraded scenarios that can crop up. Yeah, I, I had a chance to drive a Tesla recently and the, the people that make Tesla, they understand this. Tesla's mm -hmm. capable of driving itself and understanding where the car, other cars are and obstacles on the road, and red lights, mm -hmm. but they won't let you look away. It will yeah. beep at you if you're, if it, it watches your eyes. And if you look away for more than a few seconds, it'll beep that. And if you do it for more than enough, <laughs> you know, even longer, it'll actually pull over. Yeah, that's the, I think that's the technology I'm probably the most excited for, um, largely because my, my folks are getting older and like they live in the middle of nowhere, Kentucky. It's a long drive for them to the grocery store and I'd like them to be able to stay there. They like it there, mm -hmm. but they're getting to the point where they're not going to be able to operate a car for many more years. And I think there are a lot of folks in America that are in that space and we have such a big car culture. It's, ne sure. it's necessary for your own independence. Um, so that's going to be a big impact on, on geriatric care in America. And I'm really excited for it. You're talking about self-driving vehicles to get, yeah. get uh, yeah, in specific. Uh, incapacitated people or older people to the grocery store or where they mm -hmm. can go. Or yeah. like to see their friends or wherever it is. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, very cool. Uh, Jordan, where are you speaking next? 
Um, I think next I'm going to my alma mater. I'm going to talk to some students at Rose Holman about natural language processing. Mm -hmm. uh, the calls for, you know, KCDC and StirTrek and whatnot just closed, so I don't have any responses from those yet, but I would expect uh, one of those will be in the near future. I may see you at well. KCDC. I applied yeah. as well. Yeah, I'm hopeful. Uh, but uh, my friend Jeff, I talked to him the other day, and he said they have more than 10 submissions per slot. Yeah, that sounds about right. It's competitive. Good luck. Mm -hmm. like <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. This has been really interesting. Yeah. Thanks for having me. My favorite part about being a software developer is getting to build cool technology with my friends.